today's speaker is, is this is really interesting, okay? We've, we've done a lot of talking recently about franchising. And uh, arguably, the, the, the central advantage of acquiring a franchise is that it comes with an operations manual, right? And you, know, you don't have to figure out how to do it yourself. And military officers, I, I think, are particularly well qualified to run a well-designed program. It's, it's, a, it's our bread and butter. It's kind of a sweet spot for us. Now, a franchise is structured from the inside. It's opinionated. Here's how to deliver hamburgers to the world, right? But what about the reverse problem? What if it were the world that were opinionated? And what if the world had a 400 page specification for exactly what kind of hamburger it would buy and the precise conditions under which it would consume them? That's the government contracting problem, right? So as Randy is gonna describe, there is no guesswork with respect to the product or the market if you're in government contracting. You've got exactly one client, they tell you exactly what they wanna buy and how they want it to be delivered. But it's up to you to figure out how to get that done and how to get the contract in the first place. You have to design the machine to feed the market. So it's, it's kind of like a mirror image of a franchise. So today's speaker is, is Randy Wimmer, uh, United States Naval Academy class in 91. Randy has solved that exact problem lots of times. He solved it for corporate employers after he left the Navy, and then he solved it for himself by creating, scaling, and ultimately selling two companies that did their work in the federal contracting space. So Randy's got a lot of perspective on how to solve that problem, and this is a problem which, if anything, military officers are even more qualified to solve than the franchising one. So I don't know about you guys, but today I'm taking notes. And I want to let Randy pick it up from here. So Randy, are you with us, sir? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Here you just fine. Lima Charlie, go for it. I, I'm not seeing my face, you know, pop up on the screen because I messed with my camera. I don't so see I'm... your video. Well, that, that's fine. So as long as you can hear my voice, hopefully my, my camera kicks in soon. Uh, so <laughs> All you, right. Uh, I'm, I'm talking from <laughs> from the, the, the great beyond here. But uh, but first of all, hey, Jason, I was a heck of a bio. Um, most of it's probably unwarranted. Uh, but what I wanted to do today is I kind of wanted to talk not only about the entrepreneurial aspect of the federal government, but also the federal government um, contracting industry as a whole. Because I know that not everybody's a crazy entrepreneur. You know, some people just want to be in the industry and they want to know, you know, what are some pluses and minuses about it. So I want to try to address three different uh, types of jobs or career paths uh, within the federal government contracting industry. The first one, like you alluded to, Jason, was entrepreneurship, but I'm going to talk about that one last. The second one is the billable positions. It's the subject matter expert career path um, that most people kind of associate with contractors. And then the, the, the third one is, is the corporate business positions within the federal government contracting community. So, uh, so let's just jump on with what most people consider to be contractors. These are the billable folks. You know, they're the ones getting it done for the customer. And first of all, let's talk about what it is. What it can be anything. The federal government buys everything. If you can think about it, they're buying it. I'm not joking about that when I say that. They will buy everything from, again, not joking, ice sculptures all the way up to satellites. Everything in between. No joke. I've actually seen requests for proposals for uh, no kidding um, ice sculptures. So, um, so they buy everything. Now, the, the second thing you kind of need to know about um, about being a billable person or a quote unquote on site uh, contractor is, and this is this is something that um, most of us, and I'm talking about when I say us, I'm talking about you know veterans, um, transitioning military folks and certainly myself forget. And that is when we take the uniform off and we join the contracting workforce, we're no longer in uniform. And it has to be a mindset change and it's a cultural change, it really is. And what do I mean by that? Well, as soon as you take that uniform off and you become a civilian contractor, it's a nine to five job. It is not a profession at that point. And there's some pluses and minuses that go with that and that, you know, that some people enjoy and some people don't. The very first thing is, is that you are no longer a decision maker. You are in a support role supporting the decision maker. It's no longer your vision. It's your customer's vision. Again, you're in the support role. Now, a lot of folks who've been at the pointy end of the spear for an entire career or at least, you know, several years, they have a little bit of heartburn with that. It's a, it's a big adjustment for them. 
However, the plus side is that you get to leave at five o'clock every single day and leave your worries at home. I mean, leave your, leave your worries at work. You don't have to take them home with you. And that's a plus side. And I, I can't stress that enough. Um, everybody gives contractors, you know, a bad name, but two of my most pleasant job experiences in my life have been being a billable contractor. The first one, I was um, an engineering subject matter expert supporting NAVC 04M. And on that particular contract, I got to actually help solve a lot of the maintenance issues that I faced as a chief engineer. Uh, the second job that I had, I was an ORSA, Operations Research Systems Analyst, supporting Office of Secretary of Defense Studies and Analytics Support Director. That job, I had more influence, more impact upon our maritime policies and strategies than I ever possibly could have in uniform. So it's not like, you know, you're, you're this empty suit that you're making PowerPoint presentations. Yeah, you, could, you do a lot of that. Uh, but at the same time, you really can't have a significant impact. So, uh, so, where's, so where's the downside? Well, you know, it, if I had I retired uh, and I had a military pension, I'm not so sure I would have ever left either one of those two positions. That's how much I loved it. Uh, however, the one downside is money. Now, although you're paid a very fair salary for what you do, there is no increases. You can expect from then on, once you get your job offer, um, you're going to be getting inflationary pay increases. That is it. It's a job, not a career path. Big difference there. Because whatever, uh, whatever you make is 100% tied to your labor category um, billable rate that's already been defined on your contract. And here's the deal. The government's only going to pay so much money for a single person's effort, regardless of how capable they are. Doesn't matter. Does not matter. They're only going to pay so much. And that might, that dollar amount's already been set in stone before you even join the contract. And your employer is not going to lose money on you. That's a fact. Otherwise, they don't stay in business. So that's the downside. You're going to you're going to quickly, if you do a little bit of job hopping here and there, and take pay raises that way you're gonna very quickly hit a financial ceiling. Now, again, the money's not bad. Um, I was making, geez, what was I making? I was making about 100K uh, my very, for my very first contract. And that, that was about 20 years ago when 100K actually was pretty significant amount of money back in the day. So, but I made a 2.5% pay increase during my first uh, performance appraisal. I said, whoa, Boy, that blows. So I changed jobs. I thought I was being gouged. I go to my other contract, and sure enough, I got the same uh, type of pay increase at my annual performance review. So <laughs> I saw a trend, and I thought, like, wow, that sucks. So um, I need to make more money because um, I didn't have a retirement, and I had a family um, um, incident that happened, and, and all of a sudden, I have some serious financial obligations that I'm facing you know, as a parent. And um, so I did some serious research on how I could quote unquote accumulate wealth. And I came up with two ideas. And, you know, one of them was launching a federal government contracting ministry. So I tried that. And um, of course, I didn't know what I was doing. And I fell flat on my face. So then I decided that I was going to have to learn how this industry works from the business side of the house. So what did I do? I, I, um, I started job hopping. I took corporate jobs. Uh, I became a strategic capture manager for a multi-billion dollar company. I led a business unit for another you know, uh, large uh, federal government contractor. Then I ultimately decided that, hey, if I'm gonna try this federal government contracting industry out as a small business startup, maybe I should try you know, working in a small business. So I did that next. So I got some skill sets underneath my, my belt and I tried it. Again, I launched a company. So, but I learned a few things about being on the quote unquote corporate business career path in this industry. And what I did realize um, is that it's probably very similar. I can't speak uh, uh, this as a fact because, you know, I've never really been in any other industry. It's not like I've been in the automotive industry or, or anything like that. However, it appears to be very similar to what any typical 
uh, corporate job at any other large company would be. And, you know, there's a, there's a corporate ladder that you can hack up. Your, your pay is really tied to your performance. Uh, so in many regards, it's very similar. This is where I think is different. I think it's different because the federal government's sales path is completely different. There is no such thing as having a sales department where they're cold calling people or anything like that. There's no marketing department that's going out there and marketing and trying to create business that way. Nothing like that. Um, so uh, everything is tied to writing proposals. And that's everybody. Doesn't, doesn't matter what your title is in the corporate office if you have a corporate position in some way you are assisting the growth process. And what does that mean? That means you're helping to write proposals. If you're an HR person, vice president of HR, guess what you're doing? You're leading the efforts to identify key personnel to propose on your next big proposal. If you're in accounting, guess what? You're doing pricing proposals. Um, if you're on the operations side of the house, you're focused on organic growth. So um, no matter what it is that you're doing in this particular um, um, corporate office, it's going to be tied to growth of some kind and supporting a proposal effort because that's the entire industry. The entire industry is tied to writing and winning proposals. So what I did learn from uh, my experience supporting the corporate offices at three different federal government contracting companies, again, two multi-billion dollar ones, and then uh, a third one was a mature small business, is that once you learn how to make somebody else rich, <laughs> the question is, is, why the hell are you making somebody else rich and not yourself? And that was the, the question that I just stared me straight in the face. And as soon as I felt like I got to that, that point in my knowledge base, I said, what the hell? Why, why am I doing this a single day longer? And I stopped and I launched or should I say relaunched my company again. And uh, so now let's talk a little bit about the entrepreneurial aspect of the federal government contracting industry. And this is what really excites me. I'm excited by the federal government contracting industry as a market for first time entrepreneurs. And this is why. Over $500 billion are awarded each year on contract, over a half a trillion dollars. That is without question uh, the, making the federal government the world's largest customer. There is no close second, no close second at all whatsoever. It's, it's, uh, it's mind boggling how much money that they spend. So what are they buying? Well, it's like I alluded to earlier. If you can think of it, they're buying it. And they're buying it in sufficient quantities to make you stupid rich. You know, if you learn the quote unquote trade craft of this industry. So what I really like about this industry that sets it apart from nearly every other one is that it has a small business set aside goal. So what does that mean? Well, the government, the federal government has a 23% small business set aside goal. That means that they have a goal that 23% of those $500 billion that are awarded every single year are going to small businesses, businesses that you have never heard of, never heard of. We're talking about $100 billion a year or thereabouts um, going to companies that just, you know, they're obscure. They're mom and pop companies. Um, now, this is how, this is what an anomaly this is. Um, the small business set aside program. It would be like if you launched a federal, I mean, excuse me, if you launched a restaurant and um, it would be like Ronald McDonald would standing outside of McDonald's diverting 23% of his customers to your company or to your restaurant. It's, un it's unheard of. Ronald McDonald would never do that. Never do that. Even better than that, when a bus shows up or during rush hour, you know, or during lunchtime, you know, these high volume things, Ronald McDonald would be forced to subcontract 23% of their Big Macs for you to make where you can make profit off of that. 
it's just – it's just unbelievable, and it's just mind-boggling. It really is to me that uh, that the small business set-aside uh, program actually exists. Another attribute I like about this industry is less than five percent of U.S. companies pursue federal government contracts. So, what does that mean? That means you naturally eliminate ninety-five percent of your competitors by pursuing the federal government customer. So if you're a small business and you do cybersecurity um, and there's a hundred of you guys out there or gals, you know, only five of you will be competing for that government contract. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, now the question is, is why? <laughs> why do 95%? Well, here's the main reason. One is it friggin' hard. Um, you know, the dealing with the government is, is not easy. They've created this lengthy, complex proposal writing process um, in order to win work. Now, again, the plus side of that is you have just eliminated 95% of your competitors who are unwilling to learn this. Now, why are they unwilling to learn it? Well, because it's not easy to learn. Why is it not easy to learn? Because there's no MBA programs out there that specialize in the federal government contracting industry. Not a single one. Not a single one, not a top tier one. There may be some, you know, um, mail order type of MBA programs, but not a real one. And because I desperately looked. Um, even worse, there's no training programs out there that are geared towards small businesses and small business startups in this industry. Now, there's companies like Shipley, and Shipley is like the high water mark in the, you know, in the federal government contracting industry's training world. However, they're geared to companies who can afford them. Multi-billion dollar companies. Now, if you're, a, if you're a $10 billion a year company and if you're going after a billion dollar prime contract, your budget, now this is a mind boggling budget to, your budget to win is somewhere between 10 million and $40 million. So if you got 10 to $40 million that you're spending to win that billion dollar contract, but you need some serious rigor. You need, you need some very detailed activities to take place that only you can do because you're investing 10 to $40 million in it. Now, if you're a small business owner and in, you can invest somewhere between 10 and $40 million, you know, into your bid efforts, why bother? Hell, buy the small island somewhere and just, just live there and retire. So it's the, the training programs that exist aren't really applicable to the small business world. So um, another aspect I like about the federal government contracting industry is that it is the world's most robust customer. They are spending money in both good times and bad times. In bad times, they're stimulating the economy through you know, infrastructure investments. Well, how are they spending that money? It's through federal government contracts. So federal government contractors are, are winning out there. In good times, they have more tax revenue, so their budget increases, so they can buy more stuff from federal government contractors. Now, I, I pray that somebody doesn't actually do the math here because I did it, and I'm not 100% sure that I did it right. Uh, however, I believe that this is extraordinarily conservative. The federal government over the past 15 years has increased their spending on average every year by 6.6%. The federal government is a growth industry. If you're a federal government contractor, you can expect that 6.6% average annual growth in their spending without fail. It's a half a century and they've been doing that on average, it's just unbelievable. So again, it's an industry that's 100% immune to um, things like a global pandemic. Uh, it's immune to things like 9-11, um, the, the Gulf Wars one and two, stock, mar stock market crashes, it doesn't matter. They just keep on spending and spending and spending. So it's, it's pretty amazing. What a lot of people don't realize is, is that the federal government um, and federal government contracting represents passive income in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, if you're in the services industry, what you do 
I, I kind of joke about it. I say, hey, you write a good book report. Once you win the contract, you know, then you put a program manager in front of it and boom, you forget about it. I'm not joking about that. There has been times when I was running my companies where I would sit down with my finance guy uh, at the beginning of the month to close my financial records and he would comment about a contract that I forgot that I even had. And believe me, we weren't so big that I was forgetting million dollar contracts. It's because it was so passive. Program manager was doing a great job. Uh, I didn't worry about it. I empowered him to do whatever he needed to do to hire people. I gave him a target profit margin to hit. And I evaluated his performance on how well he did that and on customer satisfaction, two variables. And um, the good program managers did it and I had nothing to worry about. It was pretty amazing. However, I, I would have to say this right here is probably uh, what I really like uh, the most. And I've already said that three times, uh, but as you can tell, I really like the federal government contracting industry. And that is, is, it's like playing the lottery with unbelievably great odds. And why do I say that? Well, um, I recently launched government contracting Academy. And what I do is I help my clients, um, get to the point where they can competitively bid on massive, large prime contracts that really truly move their financial needle. And um, they're all surprised about how quickly they can get to that point to do that. And so what does this game mean? It means that you are bidding on, on contracts that can literally change your life, that can make you a multimillionaire. And the odds of winning, let's just say it's 10%. Let's say you only have a 10% chance of winning. If you bid on one of these contracts every month or every other month, at some point, I'm not going to do the math here because I'll show you just how stupid I am. But at some point within a year or two years, the numbers are on your side. You're going to land one of those. My first prime contract that I won, um, it was for $15 million. And I had six competitors, six competitors. I had a one in seven chance of winning a contract that made me a multimillionaire. One in seven. So, you know, the odds are just unbelievable. That is a game you want to play. And you want to play it over and over and over and over and over. And you know what it cost me for my lottery ticket? Sweat. A lot of hard work. I didn't have to mortgage my house. I didn't have to quit my day job. I didn't have to sell the naming rights of my first child. I didn't have to do any of those things. What I had to do is I had to work my tail end off. And, you know, most entrepreneurs are willing to do that. They have more sweat than they have venture capital backing. So, which leads me to the next thing I like about this thing. The cost of market entry to participate in this type of industry is shockingly low. It's the cost of hard work. I kept my day job. I was writing proposals. I was doing it at night after the kids went to bed. I was doing it from my kitchen table. And or Starbucks, Starbucks when they got too loud, and I, you know, I ended up winning. I actually had to invite a friend of mine to the kickoff meeting because I wanted to look like I was more than just a one-person company. So it is very doable. Now, here's the deal: um, there's a lot of misconceptions about the federal government, you know, contracting industry, you know, for entrepreneurs. And let me just quickly discuss those. The first one is you got to be a good writer to write winning proposals. Not true. I are an engineer and ain't too good of a writer. You don't write winning proposals. You build them. You build them. You create a template that addresses four perspectives. You write to those four perspectives and then you combine it. You slam it all together for all the different requirements. You throw in a few prepositional phrases, a couple lead in sentences. You soften the edges of it. So if your old English 101 teacher would happen to read it, they won't keel over with a heart attack. But uh, it's not crazy writing. It's, it's not like you have to be able to write the great American novel in order to be able to write a winning proposal. The second thing is, is that uh, a lot of people say, hey, I'm not an expert in anything. What can I sell to the federal government? Well, here's the deal. In order to launch a company, uh, you get to leverage 
two types of capabilities. Your internal capabilities, that's the stuff that's on your resume. That's the stuff that you're good at already. You have experience doing X, Y, or Z. If you're an accountant, guess what? You're in, you, you know, one of your internal capabilities is going to be accounting. But guess what? Maybe you're not an accountant. However, maybe you're good friends with an accountant. Maybe you have a good business relationship with a company that does accounting services. So guess what? Now you've got an accounting company uh, or accounting service offering within your company because that is an external capability that you have access to. That through your teaming, through your partnership, through your network, that you can bring that capability to bear. So that's an external capability. Uh, when I sold my company, I would say at least two thirds of the contracts that we were supporting, I didn't have a clue. I, 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 I would never have employed myself for, for two thirds of my company, uh, contracts. And the reason why is because I didn't know what we were really truly doing. Um, I, I couldn't write two lines of code to save my life, but I want a $15 million software development you know, um, you know, contract, um, with, which is one of my last ones that I won before I sold my company. So you don't have to have all of these capabilities organic to yourself. You can actually partner for them. And um, the other and the final one uh, misconception is that federal government contracting is a very low profit margin industry. Again, not true. Um, now, is it more of a volume based industry? It is. It is more, you know, however, uh, that lie is actually perpetuated by the federal government. The reason why is because they've been burned by $600 toilet seats, $3,000 coffee makers, you know, all these different things. So guess what they perpetuate? Like, no, we are not going to make an award to any high profit bids. So what do you do? You propose a low profit and you manage to a high profit. They're happy, you're happy. And that's a very common phrase. Propose 5% profit and manage to 25% profit. Um, I have bid as low as 4% and managed to as high as about 35%. So it can be done. You just got to understand how, the, how to, to play the pricing game and things like that. So here's the hard truth about entrepreneurship. There is no checklist or to-do list to launch a successful uh, startup company, especially in this industry, because like I said, there's not even an MBA program that even remotely you know, brushes up against what you need to know in order to be successful in this industry, which is good news if you don't have an MBA, because most of that stuff is probably irrelevant to this industry anyway. So you just, you know, that eliminates that barrier to entry. I don't, I don't understand business. Well, you don't really need to understand business. You know, you just need to understand business in this industry. Uh, so, you know, so, so how do you learn? How do you, how are you successful in this industry? Well, you're successful in this industry by following a business model or process to stay, uh, to, to, to stay on track, to keep you on, you know, in focus, to keep you looking ahead and identifying risks and opportunities. Um, I created my own you know, framework, you know, I call it the daddy framework, is called dream, analyze, define, develop, execute, and evaluate. However, any business model will work. Um, that's just the one that I had success with, and I've used it over and over and over. I used it for, you know, the success that I had for relaunching analytics strategies, secure enterprise analytics, A3IS, Planet Risk, and Planet Risk Federal. It worked for me in those cases. So, however, I'm convinced that any business model uh, will work. Uh, so here's the deal. What am I doing right now? Well, this is what I'm doing. I've, um, I, um, I launched Government Contracting Academy earlier this year. And everybody always asks me, say like, wow, if you're so damn good at this federal government contracting industry, why aren't you doing it yourself instead of trying to sell it? Well, um, I, after I sold my first company in 2016 and shares in my sec, second company in that same year, I don't have to work. My kids don't have to work ever. And so, however, and I was excited about quote unquote retiring. And then as soon as I retired, I had fun for about a month and a half. Then I got bored. And that boredom turned into stress and that stress turned into depression. And it was, um, I hated it. I hated being out of the game. So uh, once I sold my last company um, 
the end of last year in 2019, I guess it was, um, I became clear of all conflicts of interest and all of my non-competes. And I decided that I was going to launch Government Contracting Academy to help aspiring entrepreneurs. And that's what I did. Now, um, so what is Government Contracting Academy? Well, here's our mission statement. It's to provide a long-term mentoring relationship, industry resources, tools, and templates necessary to launch a 100% compliant federal government contracting company with the ability to penetrate markets, scale, and create lasting equity. So what is it really? Well, it's a year-long agreement that we have where I mentor, coach uh, you in, uh, to, to launch your own company. So I don't own part of your company. This is not a franchise or anything like that. I'm just passing knowledge. And I get to live vicariously through you while you do some pretty exciting stuff. Uh, the program is broken down into two parts. The first part is positioning your company for entrepreneurial success. And the other part is um, market penetration. Now, positioning for startup success, that's 13 modules. And that's pretty structured. And we talk about developing an infrastructure plan, uh, how to analyze RFPs, pipeline creation and management, writing proposals, pricing proposals, the stuff that you would probably suspect. And then the second part is 100% client dependent. That's where they are, you know, um, uh, that's, where, that's where I'm helping them with whatever they need in order to, to be successful penetrating markets. So what I'm doing right now is I'm launching a five to seven person cohort next month. I stopped taking clients about two months ago because my dance card is, is basically full. However, I feel like I can support a cohort together. And um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm starting um, in August. So um, there's going to be a backlog um, of people that I've turned down. And in, in fact, uh, the last two clients that I took were both ring knockers. And I made exceptions <laughs> because they're ring knockers. And I'm kind of making this announcement to this group because I'd much rather help out a classmate, uh, a shipmate, uh, a veteran than I would somebody else that I, that I don't have any affiliation with. So that's why, you know, um, you know, Jason and I were, we talked about this and I was going to make this announcement. So um, that's all I have. Oh, last question. And I know that everybody, you know, most, not everybody, but a lot of people always want to know, what does it cost? Well, here's the deal. It's not free, but it doesn't cost you anything. The real cost to pursue this market, to pursue federal government contracts, is the cost of a business intelligence subscription. You've got to have enough runway, enough heads up of a pending opportunity in order to be able to do the strategy um, aspect of this in order to give yourself a fighting chance to win. So that, uh, cause I was initially going to launch government contracting Academy as a nonprofit, but nonprofits, they don't work for a lot of different reasons. And I don't want to go into that now. So I didn't do that. Um, I, I wanted people to have some skin in the game, but I didn't want to, I didn't want it to cost them anything that cost them um, anything either. So you can either, you kind of have an option. You can either go it alone and buy your own, um, a business intelligence subscription for 10 K or you can join government contracting Academy for 10 K and we will give you all of the business Intel that you would get from your own subscription plus the entire program on top of it. So for the cost that you would have to, to pay to enter this market by buying for a business intelligence subscription, we're going to give you the entire year long program and a free set of steak knives. <laughs> I'm joking about the steak knives, but I started, I, just, I felt like I was selling there towards the end. And, um, and I don't want to sell. So that's all I have, Jason. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or anything like that. Oh um, God, I got a million of them. I, I, I wish we had more time for them. Randy, this is the first time that I've actually heard the deal, right? And I think this is, this is awesome. Uh, I, I, uh, um, I, if I needed a, a fourth job, <laughs> I would definitely, I would definitely be in this. Uh, and, uh, I just, I'm, I'm just intensely curious. So look, we, we've got to move on to updates and intros pretty quick here, but I just, I want to, I got a couple of questions. I'm going to see if I can fit one of my own questions in and let's get one question from, uh, uh, from the group do in intros and updates. And then I got a feeling we're going to be talking about this during the discussion period. But so my question, 
you mentioned sales, right? And, and I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm probably in the same boat as a lot of engineers. I hate selling. I don't really feel like I'm very good at it. it. It's just far, far outside my comfort zone. And what I heard you say is this, there, there isn't any here. It's just different. So can, can you, can I just give us another minute on what, what, what does sales look like? inside this regime? How is it different from selling stuff to other people and companies? Okay, your question was the whole reason why I put off launching my, uh, you know, getting into entrepreneurship again. Uh, uh -huh. I just assumed that entrepreneurs were just cheesy salesmen, and I didn't want to be that kind of guy. I, I'm, I'm an introvert, naturally. I'm not a gifted speaker, as the whole group knows by now. Uh, so <laughs> that's not me. Um, so, uh, what I loved about this industry is, is that 95% of it is strategy, writing a winning proposal. And again, the proposal is just the, uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg that's above the waterline. The strategy is what happens below the waterline, and that's where you win it. And um, so that's what I loved. Now, you do have to do some, quote, unquote, business networking. Now, everybody plays up the fact like, oh, you got to go to the customer and see the customer's needs. Yeah, if you're a billion-dollar company, they'll, they'll open the doors and talk to you. If you're a one-person startup, they're never going to talk to you. So business, quote, unquote, development for a startup is networking with other companies to create synergy. Now, when I'm talking about synergy, and you're talking with Northrop Grumman, because believe it or not, Northrop Grumman wants to talk to you. And here's why. Uh, when they're bidding on these big contracts, they are required and evaluated based upon their small business subcontracting plan. They need small business subcontractors mm. of various flavors. Women they got a box to check. That's right. Now, conversely, right. since they're giving up that work shared to small businesses, they want to get it back. So when you're bidding on a small business set aside and you need a capability, guess what? They want to be your guy because they want to get some of that money back. So they want to talk to you. It's not like you're pushing anything on anybody. You know, people are eager to talk to each other. So it's not like you're selling. This is something. Okay, let me let me uh, let me open up the floor. Let's get one question from the group, and then we're going to move on to updates and intros, and circle back in a bit in the in the in the, the discussion period for more. But does anybody have uh, any any uh, questions for Randy here? I I'll I'll throw a question out there, Randy. Sure, sure. What's, what's a what's a typical sort of runway from the time let's say that i i i created i incorporated my business today what's a what's a fairly normal amount of time before i might see my first government contract if i if i follow you know the the right path if you follow the right path one is you get your act together you you create a company you identify what services you want to offer what customers you're going to pursue um, start looking for differentiators. One of the things that we focus on in Government Contracting Academy is ISO 9001 certification. Get your ISO 9001 certification. Now you got something to sell. You've got an attribute because you got nothing when you're a startup. So um, if you do it right now, there's all kinds of different ways for market penetration um, to get your past performance. That's your gig. Now that's your very first goal. You got to get a past performance. And you can either do that as you know, working for yourself as a 1099, getting on a subcontract with a large bidder. But again, you got to have something to sell. You got to have a set aside status and you should have something like ISO. So to answer your question, you know, once you get all your, your, your act together, you, you know what you're going to do, how to do it. And you got your ISO certification, which you can get in a matter of two months. Most people don't realize that getting your ISO certification is so easy when you're starting. It gets crazy hard when you get bigger, um, but you can do it because you're creating processes and you're not fixing things, you know, once you're a bigger company. And I kind of wrestled with that a little bit. So to answer your question, I would probably say around the year to 18 month standpoint, you should expect to, to you know, to, or hope to, um, to, to, to start having some type of billable person. Now I'm not going to say you're going to have it in one year of in the program, but I will guarantee you this, you will know every single thing you need to know in order to be able to, to be successful in the industry. And then it's just hustle. It's just, it's effort-based. But, um, but yeah, I would say once you know what you need to know, it should happen probably within about six months to a year. I'm sure it's not uncommon. You know, we, we, uh, uh, we, we do our, our, our last tours, typically a short tour, you know, and, and, and we know we're getting out, whether we're just getting out or retiring or what have you. And we sit on shore duty and we look around us and we go, damn, I could do this better. You know, and, and, and so I would imagine that a lot of guys <clears throat> get out of the service 
with one or two ideas in their hats uh, for, for, for things that they, you know, sort of contracting opportunities, right? Like I, 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 I know this organization, I work for this organization. I could come back, come back as a, you know, as a civilian contractor and fix this organization. And, and so I wonder, uh, if, if I've got that kind of depth, uh, you know, in a, a particular sector, am I better off pursuing and perhaps trying to create an opportunity there? Or am I better off, following what may be the formula and, 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 you know, searching the RFPs and, and, and looking for an existing requisition that I could service. Can, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. That's probably one of the most common, uh, commonly made mistakes that I bump into. And that is, is that um, people have a great idea. And, but when you have a great idea and you're trying to sell it to the government, there's a couple of challenges immediately involved with that. The very first one is, is that one is a seven year long budget, you know, and if you have to convince the customer of the need for this solution, you're never going to get the face time necessary to do that. They're not going to open the door to allow a small business owner to come in there to change the world, create disruption and all that kind of stuff. So um, they really, and, and I know that's probably not what you wanted to hear, what most people don't expect to hear from me, but the value of the federal government marketplace is that any given time, there's between 20 and 30,000 active solicitations. That means that they're either going to be awarded in a few months, uh, they're already in the process of um, being released, or what have you. So 20 to 30,000 active opportunities. If you can't find one that really kind of, you know, makes you happy, um, you creating the 30,000th and first one isn't, isn't a high probability endeavor for a startup. Now, if you're IBM, you pick up the phone, you call, they call, and they, you call the customer, and boom, they're there. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, they want to talk to you, but, but not for small business. So that's one of the – because – and this is – and, I, and I, kind of, I kind of communicate this way. Don't try to sell the cure for cancer. Don't sell it. You know, nobody's going to buy it because it's risky because they've never bought it before. Sell a bottle of aspirin. They bought it before. They know they need aspirins and they're willing to buy it from you. So um, that's, that's a horrible thing to say as a taxpayer and as a human. But, you know, don't try to be too innovative with the federal government because they're resistant to that. Especially for- uh, unless you're innovating within the uh, sort of within the 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 lines that they've drawn in a in a solicitation i imagine absolutely absolutely create innovative solutions to requirements that they already know and that are already funded because getting getting a need funded is non-trivial if you've ever been you know in an acquisition you know position randy um you you mentioned a, a couple of times this this notion of a small business right so there's this small business set aside for uh uh, uh, for, for contractors. So um, really two questions around that. So number one, uh, is, is, there, is, is there a formal definition? I mean, it, 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 are, there, are there certain criteria that you have to make sure that you continue to meet in order to qualify as a small business? And, and secondly, is, is this something that we should consider to be a, is it a permanent opportunity? Is it something that comes and goes with political administrations? You know, how, 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 how real is this thing over time? Oh, the, the small business set aside program is etched in stone. It really is. And what a lot of people don't realize is, is that most of the people who are, um, um, who are leaving the military, not most, every person leaving the military can be certified as a service disabled, better known small business. And a lot of people say, Hey, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. I've got no injuries or anything like that. Uh, but that may be the case. Uh, however, you can still operate as a certified, um, uh, veteran, uh, 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 SDBOSB, Service Disabled Veteran and Small Business. And here's the catch. If you apply for the program, you're guaranteed to get it. And here's why. Um, you know, following all the, the, the turmoil and the, the, the abuse, I'll even say that, the abuse that veterans took after the Vietnam War and Agent Orange and being denied their service disability claims, all this kind of stuff, the federal government says, whoa, 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 from now on, we trust, the, we trust the veterans. If they say they have a service disability, they have one. 
then you go to a medical rating process and they'll they make say that you have zero percent you know um function this you know disability so it has zero percent impact on your ability to function however you still have a service disabled um a service disability and you will have a service disability letter with a zero percent rating which as of just a couple years ago and i doubt that they've changed the law since then you can you are certified as a um, or you can get certification as a service disabled veteran and small business and that is a very big deal because of that 23 percent they further earmarked um, opportunities for certain types of set of sides and three percent goes to service disabled veteran and small businesses five percent goes to minority owned small businesses the 8a program five percent go to women owned small businesses three percent goes to hub zones or historically underutilized business owned companies. So as a veteran, you know, you're all you're all but guaranteed at least that extra set aside status as a service disabled veteran and small business. And that's a big deal because my very first prime contract that I won was a service disabled veteran owned small business set aside. Again, there were only six other bidders. So it's kind of a big deal. 